Welcome to the Fitness Industry Success Show. Ideas, inspiration, and interviews to take your fitness business to the next level. Next level. With over 23 years of fitness industry experience and the founder of Lead Lion, an innovative fitness marketing agency, here's your host, Nick Parker. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Fitness Industry Success Show. So glad you're here. We got Blair McCaney with us today, who is the CEO of MX Metrics. Uh, did I say that right, Blair? It's MX well, Metrics. <laughs> and uh, listen, this guy is the real deal. So it, you probably already know who he is, but for many of you that might not know who he is, let me give you the rundown here so you know who you're listening to today. He is Medallia's partner to the fitness industry. You know, MX Metris was named Innovative Company of the Year by Fitness Industry Technology Council and is the leading member experience platform for the fitness industry itself. Blair is also the founder and president of Confluence Fitness Partners. So what they do is they operate gyms throughout central Washington since 1983. So real hands experience right there. He's also an educator, practitioner, student, and subject matter expert on operational ex member experience management. Blair, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so glad you're here. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. Awesome. You know, the operational member experience management always sounds such corporate speak, but we'll, it does. we'll flesh it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are going to flesh that out. So if right there you got a little confused, hang on there because we're, in a little bit, we're going to talk about why your, your gym members are leaving. So, but before we drive in, let's play a little game. I love to play this game. We're going to have our audience guess. We're going to play two truths and one lie. So you're going to play, you're just going to come up with two things that are true, one that's a lie in no particular order. And let's see if I can guess, and then we'll see if our audience can guess. Okay. Used to do barrel racing in rodeo. Hmm. Has no formal education. Hmm. Was a circus clown. Oh, that's a tough one. Okay. So you're saying barrel racing in a rodeo, no formal education and was a circus clown. This is one of those that I don't think I'm gonna get. <laughs> wow, barrel racing, circus clown, and no formal education. I, I know you're a smart guy, but that may be the one to throw us off here. So I'm gonna say um, barrel racing is the lie. You're correct. What? Oh, I can't believe I got it. <laughs> Yeah, you are. <laughs> I am shocked. So you were a circus clown? <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, quick, quick story. Where I'm from in Wenatchee, Washington, I grew up, we'd have a, a fabulous circus from here. Everybody has to be under 18. You go on scholarship. I'm the youngest of five boys. I had a brother who was a catcher on the trapeze, another brother that did Roman ladders, did high wire. Um, I was young, so I was a clown in the circus. That's <laughs> awesome. That's so cool. Well, there you go. And then I, I know you're a smart guy. I, I've, I, you know, I know you a little bit and I've, I've listened to you speak before. So no formal education lesson right there. It, it doesn't matter. You can be very successful without one, right? <laughs> yeah. You, you, you have to learn how to learn and you have to yeah. be willing to learn continuously. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you're, you're, you're an avid learner. So that, that makes all the difference in the world. Well, let's dive in a little bit. You know, the fitness industry has uh, been through a tough uh, season, but we're coming out of that season. And you are, as well as, uh, as I, very bullish and very optimistic on the next 6, 12, 18, two years, months, two years on the growth of the fitness industry. Talk to me a little bit why you feel that way. And, and for, for clarity, for me, Nick, I think we're going into the best decade for the fitness industry ever. I love it. I love it. I believe it and I love it. Yeah, so. and part of the reason is the massive trends out there. You can dial down and look at the micro trends that people are coming back, our sales, we've had the best sales in our two clubs in central Washington here, better than 2019 the last two months, we have the lowest attrition. Those are micro trends that says, ooh, something positive out there. But if you look at the macro trends across countries, of uh, the focus on wellness, the, the change in spending levels for your own health, that, that the, the, how healthcare is changing. The, the big economic macro trends aren't gonna shift quickly. The micro trends could shift quickly, mm -hmm. but it's the macro trends that you, that you think, well, how do those 
How do those converge? How do they solve for these problems? How do those converge? And the answer is people have to move. I mean, you know, and, yeah. and look at the money that's being dumped into technology. Look at the private equity firms that are looking at fitness now and looking for new innovators in fitness, in bricks and mortar fitness too. Mm -hmm. Looking for new innovators in bricks and mortar. Um, you know, the fact that big private equity acquired ABC should tell people something. Mm -hmm. I mean, Toma Bravo doesn't just play around. I mean, that, that, is a, that is a big company. So there's just, there's so many massive data points. So about a year ago, roughly when everything sucked and all the journalists were saying, this is the death of the fitness industry. It'll never be back again. And Peloton, and I have Peloton. I have two Peloton bikes, one in my office, one in my house, right? And so, and they were, I, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, no, it isn't. And then I started thinking, do I just have confirmation bias? Am I like, uh, I said, well, let's go find the data that shows that the industry is in, gonna be in trouble. Mm -hmm. The only data was that people were buying a bunch of home fitness stuff and that people were doing stuff on digitally. That, yeah. that was it. I, I completely agree. If, and what's going to happen now is if you use any one of those things as your entire fitness strategy, you've screwed up. A fitness strategy is going to include, for most, for most people, it's going to include some at-home stuff. It's going to include some virtual stuff. And it's going to include bricks and mortar fitness. And yeah. especially... Now, here's where we could get left behind in that whole thing. So these mega trends are pushing up, you know, up and to the right towards more activity, more focus on wellness, more focus on mental health as the reason that you exercise, more right. of that. Our fitness industry could say, oh, look at all these massive trends. Let's just jump on and surf that. But if you're just going to operate as you've always operated, if you're not going to look at those trends and say, how do we need to be different in order to ride those trends? I think just sort of being the same, what you're going to do is you might just sit in one spot and innovators might move around you and take over mm -hmm. the space. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Blair. You know, I was on the way into the office downtown Orlando this morning and, you know, six, 12 months ago, it was a ghost town. There, there was nobody yeah. around, but we are a resilient nation and a forgetful people as well. We quickly forget the past. And I think that as the masks have been removed, we're seeing that that upward slide in the industry, but you just made a really good point that if you're not innovative and creative on pivoting and really adapting to this curve that we're about to see, uh, you're going to get left behind because I think there's going to be a flood of players entering the industry and also the big guys are going to be acquiring the little guys and accelerating their growth. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, don't you think? I totally agree. And, that, and that's what we're seeing right now. And so I was asked this question, like, who could really be a tough competitor that we don't see right now. And, and I think if you look at big trends, it seems to me that, th that there is an opportunity for private equity mo type money, mm -hmm. technology. I mean, Apple built their own studio in Santa Monica for content and we have God knows how much content's out there and how many fitness apps are out there. Mm -hmm. um, you think about the electronic medical record and how people are now reporting into their electronic medical record. And mm -hmm. my mom in Las Vegas weighs herself and it automatically updates her electronic medical record. So you, you look at those things and then you build in bricks and mortar. And then you say somebody that really understands all of those things mm -hmm. and has the money to do it could be a major disruptor. Yeah, that's, that's, you're right. That's going to be huge. You got anybody in mind? No, you don't have to say it, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I could be wrong, but those are just so big and there's, um, there's so much money to be made. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult problem to solve. Right. When you solve difficult problems, you make lots of money. Yeah. The more difficult, the more money, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and, I, and I think, and I think if you just think about clubs, like what do we, you know, you think about a club operator like me, two clubs in central Washington. And, and then you say, well, what, what should I be innovating on? What should I be, should I be doing virtual? Yeah, there's plenty of people doing virtual. I think the things we need to be innovating on is much better engagement with our members, better programming, better education for our staff. Our staff need to be able to talk the language and have the behaviors that support this idea of mental wellness. Mm. We need to have that language. It can't be a marketing story and then people come in and just see the same old crap. 
You know right. What I mean? Right. You know, we, we have to be what we say we are out there. Right. And if you want to get on those trends, I don't think it's like you have to have this major shift and have psychologists on your, I, and, and maybe you do, I don't know, but <laughs> and have, you know, psychologists on your staff. Right. I think you have to take the trends seriously mm -hmm. and say, how can we be part of the solution here and not just sell memberships? Yeah, I completely agree. It's we got to get away from being the me too business and see all your competitors and they're doing this. So I'll do it. And they're doing this. So I'll do it. We got to be find ways to stand out, which is a good transition to talk about that member experience, because you said something in a past interview that you basically are your member experience. That is your product is your member experience yeah. right in the fitness industry and when you're operating health clubs and gyms and, and studios. So let's talk a, a little bit about the the kind of the negative side first and then we'll talk about you know what are some solutions to remedy that is why are gyms losing members why are members leaving gyms um not that we're seeing a mass exodus right now but why is there attrition why do they leave what are some of these common issues that gyms are facing so and that that's one of the data points we collect we collect collect a lot of cancellation experience where we want to understand the reason they canceled any coaching they'd like to provide the company and you know also likelihood to repurchase in the future if that if that club is an option so that's a lot of data points that a lot of data points that we collect uh multiple reasons people leave gyms and uh my friend bryce hastings over at less mills i i talk a lot about habit creation if you can if if we are focused on helping people create an exercise habit and for a long time you know gyms they just sell memberships and then they hold out as testimonials people that created an exercise habit not because of anything we did right we just opened our doors and people came in and they by, by some th their own nature created an exercise habit we hold them up as a testimonial to what we did we sold them a membership right 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 so i feel it's so um the the center of our strategy in our clubs is to create exercise habits with people well, uh, Bryce uh, and I got talking about this and he said, yeah, you know, there's a big difference between habit instigation and habit execution. And our industry has been in the business of habit execution, not habit instigation. Okay. The reason people leave is because they don't develop an ex. That's one reason they don't develop an exercise habit and we could have done a better job. And the answer isn't just selling personal training. A lot of times <laughs> we put in that, we put in that consulting piece up front. Right. To say, well, let's be when it's really a, a just the second sales mechanism to sell a service. And oftentimes we may be selling a service to somebody that doesn't need it oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So people need because they don't build. Um, uh, and, and let's let's take out the obvious that, you know, they moved, they they lost their job. Right. Obvious. Right. But, the, but the, because they don't get a uh, they don't create a good exercise habit and people leave because of bad experiences. That's yeah. The, to, so there's main two main categories that you're saying. One is they don't build the habit, and then two is um, they had a, a bad experience that rubbed them the wrong way, or something happened to cause them to leave. So, I'm sorry, Nick. I uh, want to yeah. on, on the bad experience piece. And when I say that, it's usually not everything's going great. One bad thing happened, and I'm going to leave. If everything's going great, people are extremely forgiving of that one bad thing that happens. It's, right. <clears throat> it's a bunch of little bad things that happen. That's mm -hmm. the bad experience. Yeah. Interesting. And so then it's sometimes, a bunch then of sometimes one thing will trigger. <clears throat> yeah, that's really interesting. So you have a, a series of underlying little things that are kind of annoyances over time. And then all of a sudden there's the straw that breaks the camel's back and then they cancel. Yeah. So, okay, got it. So let's, can we dive into those just real quick before moving on? Um, I think there's something interesting there. So habits man there's so much there there's psychology there's past experience there's behavior there's the people that are around you there's the community your influence how does a fitness center a gym surround these people to help them change those habits that seems like a huge undertaking in my mind but uh please share any ideas or, or what's worked or kind of you know how, how to get around that so I, I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of things. Um, the, the the first thing is that people have to feel some instant gratification when they come in, mm -hmm. and you know what instant gratification is when you come in is the second day after you join, you walk in and somebody says good morning, Nick. That's yeah. instant gratification. Right. And 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 we. I, this is going to sound so cliche, but it is so freaking important 
that we learn how to really engage people on a human level with our humans. And that technology should be helping the human to human interaction. Right. And the technology should be used to take away friction and, and stuff that isn't fun for the member should be made to be really easy on this device. Right. And yes. you know, the simple stuff that people are doing when they subscribe to Hulu and unsubscribe to Hulu or whatever, right. Mm -hmm. that, that's where technology should live. That's, that's, that's number one. Number two, I think we focus our technical minds kick in, right? So the minute somebody comes in and our technical minds kick in with the best of intentions. And so that member comes in and they say, I, I really, I have whatever goal they have. And unfortunately, oftentimes people come in with extrinsic motivators. And those that have extrinsic motivation are far less likely to stay on than people that have intrinsic motivation. I think of it almost more as people that are motivated to hit a goal and people that are inspired to have a lifestyle, right? There's a right. difference there. There's a difference there, there. So oftentimes people come in with that extrinsic motivation. We, we grab onto that and dude wants to lose 40 pounds, right? And we immediately, mm -hmm. our tech, you know, our technician hats say, it's got to be this much exercise. Food should be like this. Let's get him with the trainer. Yeah. And then he's like, crap, I'm out of here. I don't want any to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you think about how hard of a, how hard of a lift that is for somebody who, who let's say they're deconditioned. They haven't worked out in 30 years. They, yeah. they have this goal, their entire strategy, their entire Big ask. strategy <laughs> is to come in and buy a gym membership. Right. Right. So then, then, they're going to change their lifestyle. I'm going to get up now at 4.30 in the morning. I'm going to work out at five. I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to, the only way this is going to work is if they have sheer willpower and then that's only going to last for so long. Right. So I would contend that we are, we need to teach people how to pack a gym bag. We need to teach people how to have their clothes ready the next morning, where to set them, have a checklist of just getting your stuff together mm -hmm. so that when you wake up in the morning, you have no decisions to make. You just grab your, you put on your gym clothes, you grab your bag, you go out the door, all your decisions are made the night before. That's more important than getting them on a one hour workout. That is Start. so interesting. Yeah, that, I think that's the first time I've ever heard that. That's, that's really interesting. The, just the details, managing the smaller steps and actions to get them to slowly build the habits, which then really lead to the outcomes, right? That's right. Just to that's get them in the door, get them moving. And, and, and think about that, right? So uh, all habit creation is like trigger routine reward. And so if we were really teaching that and trigger is your environment. So we say, okay, Nick, here's how it works. The minute you walk home and you hear the door close behind you, that's the trigger. Here's the routine. Go empty the sweaty clothes out of your gym bag, put it in the laundry room. Mm -hmm. Go in and get out and get out tomorrow's workout clothes, stack those in the bathroom. Go get all your work clothes that you got to wear and hang it on the doorknob going out the door. Right. That's the routine. Can we agree on the trigger and can we agree on the routine? If we, I'm not worried about the workout. Right. Let's agree on the trigger and the routine. And then your reward is wh whatever, sit down and have a glass of wine, play with your kids, watch the news with your wife, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you do not, do not sit down until you finish the routine. Yeah, I, I love it. I think this is amazing because you're right. We are in an industry where a majority is just selling a membership and then they never talk to you again. And I'm not going to mention the brand I go to, but I, the gym I go to, I've never heard them say my name. <laughs> so it's really unfortunate. I walk in, they don't even look at me. It's like I have a disease or something that they're afraid to catch. I don't know. It's terrible. So <clears throat> I would love to see that. The only reason that I stick around is because I'm a diehard. Otherwise, I'd probably jump that's straight. Right. That's it, you know? No, no. That's such a great point, though, Nick. You just said it. The only reason I stick around is because I'm a diehard. The people that we put in, in internally in our vernacular we call it hardcore people that average more than three visits a week. Mm -hmm. They're averaging a greater than three per week. It could be, it could be 3.25, right? But greater than three a week is that hardcore group. And that's the one you got to do some damage. They're still going to come in. Um, but you still, you know, th there's other damage that's done. Like if this was a private conversation, you would have told me the brand name, right? Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> I would have. If, yeah, this was, if this was you and some buddies at the bar, or you having a dinner party at your house, you would have said the brand name. Right. And yeah. you want to know where they wouldn't have gone? 
mm -hmm. where you're going. Right, exactly. Plus there's just no other choice. And that's the hidden tax. Man, that is the hidden tax that clubs pay for not getting this right. Yeah, exactly. I think you're you're so right on the money with this. The last two or three guests that I've talked to, we've talked a lot about like having a Chick-fil-A experience in the health clubs where it's my pleasure and thank you and saying your name and being polite and really delivering a higher level of customer service because it feels like it's been lost in so much of the industry. Now, I will say there's been places where I've been really wowed, and, uh, but it's, it's probably um, far and few in between when it comes to the fitness industry. So, so the other side of that was bad things happen. I've had bad things happen. My son, <laughs> I have a 16 year old son and he got threatened by a grown man at this, the health club we go to and they handled it okay, but he got threatened for doing nothing because he was in the way and the guy was grumpy and having a bad day and he threatened to do all kinds of stuff and my son was just like beside himself. But that's an extreme measure. What are the bad things that are happening in, in clubs that maybe gym owners are not thinking about right now that they should start paying attention to, like on a smaller level, maybe? On the smaller level, um, I'll give you some real practical things. Front desk staff not having answers is a mm. big one. And, uh, and front desk staff are trying to be friendly. You have people out there trying to be friendly. And by the way, you, you can't manage this stuff by memo. You, you can't right. say, oh, um, you guys need to be more friendly. How do I be more friendly? And by the way, how do I be more friendly when I'm addressing issues up here? Because people are asking me about this and I don't have the information at my fingertips to provide the answer to that member that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Or you've given me a policy to enforce that it's impossible for me to be friendly. Right. There, there are a few brands out there and especially during the pandemic and in areas that where people were closed a long time and you have this real existential experience where mm -hmm. people have been incredibly introspective and they took the time to say, wow, we've got to do something different. And I really do believe, Nick, that there has been an up level a professionalization of our industry. Yes. And maybe even more so in the areas that were closed the longest because when everybody closed, they didn't say, oh my God, how am I going to sell memberships tomorrow? Right. They said, holy crap, how do I keep my customer? Right. Yep. Everything was about keeping the customer, and now it's about getting the customers off freeze. Mm -hmm. Those clubs that have that delivered on their member experience beforehand that didn't just think about their own balance sheet, but mm -hmm. respected the member's balance sheet while they were closed. Right. Right. Yep. Those are the ones that'll have the least people on freeze and we'll get people off freeze fastest and have the most return. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. So that, that's really awesome stuff. I appreciate you sharing that. So let's talk about the positive side of this. Um, I know that you have uh, a company that has so many data points and um, I guess you guys do uh, some sort of, uh, you know, consulting or implementation or helping on, Hey, these are the points. Here's some ideas to go and, and improve these areas. Um, how do you fix that? How do you plug the hole in the bucket? <laughs> so there's there's some things that are consistent when it's a bad experience. There's some things that are just phenomenally consistent. Generally, there's something broken in the training and onboarding process for uh, team members. Okay. Uh, and, and generally, that's broken because the company might have a mission statement and a customer experience vision, but it's just on paper and hasn't been, it doesn't animate the company. Right. A lot of people have vision, mission, values, but they don't use them to actually animate the company to say, based on these vision, mission, values in our marketplace, what is a really good strategy for us and how do we bring these pieces to life in our day-to-day -day operations? Hmm. That okay. manifests itself. That systemic issue manifests itself as certain practices, like just hiring people, making them go through the, here's where you park, here's the SOP, go out and be friendly. Instead, right. of it, instead of we're going to focus on the purpose of your role, how it ties to the purpose of the club, because what you do is a fractal. It's just a fractal of the purpose of the club. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a piece of the same, you know, this is glass. You break the glass. Here's a piece of the glass. You're part of that purpose yep. to teach the purpose, yeah. to, to give people guide rails, not like specific tasks, but broad guide rails that allow them to use their heads and their hearts when they're addressing a customer. 
Love and then it. give them the technology and tools that empower them to get things done, to be friendly. That that's that's one thing. That's people. Yep. And then policies. As so many clubs design their policies to be friendly to their own business. And they haven't even gone through. I I, I challenge people all the time, go in and buy a membership at your club. Now <laughs> You know, it, that wouldn't work at my clubs because I have two, right? Right, but, yeah. But, it, but, or, you know, have somebody else do it. And we have, a, we have an awesome customer in the Midwest that we went and did two days of consulting with them. And beforehand, uh, Jenny that works for us went in the day before and went in, used our company credit card, bought a membership, right? So that we could actually give them feedback on that. We scheduled experiences all over their club and went, nobody knew us. And we went and went through those experiences. Then we all got back in a room and evaluated some of the, the process and policies that were in place. And then, the, then you start to find out which, and by the way, a lot of these fixes cost nothing. Yeah, that's the great thing about it. Oh, I'm telling you. Yeah. Most people think when you, you think your product is the facility and equipment, you focus on CapEx. Yep. Well, we got to make the experience better and it's all CapEx. Uh-uh. It's yeah. there's so much process and policy and business practices to fix. I love the undercover boss idea. Go in under the radar, shop your own club, secret shoppers. Remember those? That used to be a big thing. Uh, it still yeah. is in some areas, but secret shopping. I love that. That's yeah, and even, even, even if everybody knows you, have you tried to buy a membership online with your club? Have you tried to schedule a class on your app? Have you tried? Just go do it. Yeah. You know, just yeah. It, what's that experience like? Is there a lot of friction? Is it frustrating? Right. Is it going to make you bounce instead of make you stick? You know, so exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I love what you're saying because I, I think it's been understated. I want to put emphasis on it is um, how important it is to slightly adjust each one of these levels and be more, or each one of these areas be more intentional about your mission statement and what you're trying to do. Back when I had, I sold my company years ago and I had two facilities and I always, we had a SOP, Standard Operating Procedure for who did you delight today? fill out their name, what did you do? And you had to make somebody smile because our thing was, we are the best part of a lot of people's days. There's a lot of stress in life, there's work, there, they come here to play, to sweat, to feel good, to have wellness, to smile, to hear good music, to have a great experience. How did you delight them? And that's what you're talking about is really making this one of the best parts of their day instead of a, the opposite, right? Yep, we call them memorable moments or M&Ms. And we have- M&Ms, I love it. We have them in, uh, we have them at different levels and there's the everyday M&Ms and that's part of it. Then there's what we call special M&Ms and that's when the everyday M&Ms, memorable moments happen, what we call in the whirlwind. You've heard that term, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's you're doing your job. You're right. at the front desk, you're talking to people. Those are the everyday memorable moments. Nick, good morning, you know, and making yeah. eye contact. And when that front desk is busy, you are the entertainment host, man. That's what you <laughs> That's, yes. the, that's the job. That's the everyday. Then we okay. have what we call special. And we, and we teach these, right? We have a framework for teaching this. Special M&Ms require you to remove yourself from the whirlwind and think. And so we have these, I wish I, I wish, if I'd known this, I'd have one with me. It's just a card. It's a, it's a blank, like a greeting card. It's blank on the inside. It's black and it has my, the name of my clubs are Works. And it has the green Works logo on it. They say nothing inside. Every staff member is required to send these out every single week. And all they're going to do is you, you, and we teach them how to stop and think about it. So was there somebody that came in? So pandemic ends, Nick comes in for the first time and you say, hi to Nick, you have a bit of a conversation. Log that in your memory. When you're done with your shift, you go grab a works card and you write in it, Nick, thanks, man. You made my day. It can be anything. Yeah. Sometimes it's, I was so sorry to hear about your wife. Sometimes mm. it's your kids were awesome in kids club today. They have to do two of those a week. Every staff member, they fold them up every day. There's a stack for our general manager. They must use their own handwriting. We don't want just handwrite on the envelope. We put a real stamp on it. Those go out every stinking day. I love that. But and that's they, amazing. Those M&Ms, yeah. memorable moments. Yep. 
And then we have what we call over the top M and M's, and I won't get into those, but they are over the top. Some of them that they've done. Yeah. Okay, you can't tease me. You got to give me at least one. What's an over the top M and M? An over the top M and M is we had the we had uh, a member who uh, he, she and her husband were going to Hawaii to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary, and learned about it. They were regulars in one of the group fitness classes, and so that group fitness instructor changed all the music to feature Hawaiian music. She got all of the regulars oh, okay. together. They came in, everybody had lays that they wore during this and to, to tell them congratulations on their 25th wedding anniversary. Then they took one wow. step further. They bottle, bought a bottle of champagne from us and had it in their room at the hotel when they got there. That is so cool. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Now, these members have been members for 10 years. They buy personal training. They bring people. Land. They right. and so understanding the context is really important too, right? Right. And and then what we do is we empower our people to don't ask permission and go do this stuff. If right. you go way over, by the way, we have what we call freedoms and obligations. Mm -hmm. So um, I won't go through all of them, but number one is you're free to do whatever you think is right to make the member happy. You are obligated to stay within our values and principles. That's number one. Number nine. Is you're free to make mistakes. You're you're obligated to learn from those mistakes. So if it was it. way too over the top, you're not fired. We're just gonna say, oh man, maybe you shouldn't have given them a free one year membership, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be stealing. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying, and I love that you empower people to do something, and then they're not afraid, and they're going to try to bend over backwards to make it to do something special. That's right. Okay. Uh, yeah. I the, the other the yeah. other uh, great consequence of that is people feel like they're doing good work and they stay longer as an employee right yeah i love it i you know i'm in florida and you're in washington but i want to come join your gym <laughs> <laughs> you can join online so. yeah i can join online maybe just kind of work out over there through zoom but <laughs> i want to experience that that's incredible because it's it's such a rarity in the day that we live in but i do think you're right we're going to see a huge surge of that where everyone's becoming more professional and leveling up their customer experience and their member engagement and that's really huge um real quick the last thing we kind of touched on it a little bit but uh loyalty you know creating stickiness longevity and membership i think a lot of what you talked about already is going to automatically do that but is there something specific that you feel would be valuable to share to be intentionable intentionable about uh keeping members long term well the the, the first thing I, and it just it just sounds so cliche but you, everybody everybody needs to understand what engagement looks like. So uh, our personal trainers don't get to just engage with their clients. Mm -hmm. they, they have to go out and talk to other people and introduce themselves and not to sell anything. Right. Our housekeeping staff takes great pride in their housekeeping staff friendliness score. Mm -hmm. And they're, it's not just that they clean, it's not just that our gyms are spotless, it's that they take great pride in the fact that members know their names, their housekeeping. Members right. know their names and members say how friendly they are. It, those things are what mm. creates stickiness. So years ago, I was with Gold's Gym. I was on the advertising committee. We spent quite a bit of money each year uh, doing market research. Uh, you know, uh, top box awareness, unaided awareness, aided awareness against the brand and, and then reasons for joining. Uh, a sense of community was always in there as a reason to join. Nobody ever checked that box. It was price. Mm -hmm. And it was location and hours, right? I mean, like, it's the, it, can I use it? Can I get there and use it? Right. But when reasons for staying, number one reason was always sense of community. Really? Oh, I believe it. Yeah. So you join, you join for the practical stuff. Right. You stay for, for what the, for the love you have for the brand. So I, I want to, so one, one more thing on it. You have to understand yeah, your brand. Uh, so, uh, you mentioned the Chick-fil-A experience and, 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 and my pleasure and thank you. And so um, our clubs are fairly informal. We script nothing. Mm -hmm. We hired people because of their values. And we tell them, if we have a PA announcement, we're not giving you a script. It's here's the three things you have to tell people. And I, I, I'll, we say this in what we call our context training. If you want to sing that message, get on <laughs> and sing that message. 
<laughs> we want them to be themselves. So right. I when so as we were going through it's some fine tuning on training. Uh, I said, what, what 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 do you guys say when somebody says thank you? And you say, you're welcome. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Never now, saw that coming. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you know, what I don't want to say, what I don't want to hear you say is no problem. Right. And, right. and my pleasure would be more suitable um, to a Ritz Carlton, I think, than to works of Wenatchee Valley and mm -hmm. an agricultural community of blue collar work ethic. And right. so, so we say thank you. Right. Yeah. I so love it. That's a big part of the stickiness. Know your brand, and that mm -hmm. your brand should be conveyed in every word, in your uniforms. I mean, every one of our staff members, they, each department gets to make up their own saying for the backs of their shirts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so at the for front desk, it's host on the front, and on the back, it says, You had me at hello. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> and then usually they're movie quotes, you know, and that, yep. that has to fit the purpose, but. Everything that's so good. That's intense. so amazing. That that's really insightful because when you think of the fitness industry, you don't think in those terms. You know, 20 years ago, it was a bodybuilder at the front desk, and it was a smaller gym, and everybody kind of did know everybody, but it was a very intimidating environment. But it was still a community. But now we're trying to get back to building the community, especially in the big box health clubs, right? building yeah. that community because it's invaluable and you can't really put a price tag on how important that is because it's going to help with retention it's going to help with stickiness it's going to help with referrals it's going to help with uh just overall reviews online and the best marketing in the world is just care right just care care about people and make a difference so yeah I, i'm going to plug something really quick here for my sure. friend, uh herb, herb lipsom and he uh, has been managing club big clubs for a long time and he just wrote a book that I, I'm, I, I think comes out in August on managing health clubs. The name of the book, Caring. There you go. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to read that one for sure. <laughs> so you got to send me, once it comes out, you got to send me the link. I'll be the first one to buy it. <laughs> you got it. You got That's it. Awesome. Well, Blair, I can't thank you enough. I hate that we're out of time because I really could go on for another half hour on this conversation because it's something I'm also very passionate about. From the receiving end, I love to experience it. And then also I love to see it done to make people's days and how that impacts their day. So maybe if I see you at Ursha, we can catch up and, and continue the conversation and do a live interview there or something like that. Let's do, I would love to do that. I will be at Ursha. I'd love to do a live interview there, Nick. Okay. Yeah, I'll catch up with you then. I'll bring the, the gear and, and we'll do so we'll continue the education. Awesome. <laughs> you have educated us for sure. So hey, awesome. thank you so much for tuning in. Remember that the more you grow. Uh, you know, just you got to subscribe to take your fitness company to the next level so you can hear amazing people like Blair, uh, who just dropped so many golden nuggets and bombs on us of wisdom today. It's incredible. So like, share, subscribe, and until next time, we'll see you then.